We should glory in the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ, in whom is our salvation, life, and resurrection, through whom we are saved. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, and the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Amen. I welcome you as we begin this Easter Triduum. In this glorious celebration the Lord has given unto us. We are invited in a very special way to follow Jesus Christ, that we may celebrate this Paschal mystery by dying truly in our old life and rising with him in a new life. We have started this celebration that to reach its climax in the celebration of the Easter Vigil, the mother of all vigils. In this celebration, we we'll listen to the word of God. There will be the washing of the feet, and then there will be the liturgy of the Eucharist. My brothers and sisters, let us acknowledge our sins that we may prepare ourselves to celebrate the second mysteries. I confess to Almighty God and to you, my brothers and sisters, that I greatly sinned in my thoughts, in my words, in what I've done, what I've failed to do, through my faults, through my faults, through my most grievous faults. Therefore, I ask Blessed Mary, Ababaji, all the angels and saints, and to you, my brothers and sisters, to pray for me to the Lord our God. May Almighty God have mercy on us. Forgive us our sins and bring us to everlasting life.
Let us pray. O God, who have called us to participate in this most sacred supper, in which your only begotten Son, when about to hide himself over to death, entrusted to the church a sacrifice new for all eternity, the banquet of his love, grant, we pray, that we may draw from so great a mystery the fullness of charity and of life. The Lord Jesus Christ, your Son, who lives and reigns with you in the unity of the Holy Spirit, one God forever and ever. of Exodus. In those days, the Lord said to Moses and Aaron in the land of Egypt, this month shall be for you the beginning of months. It shall be the first month of the year for you. Tell all the congregation of Israel that on the tenth day of this month, they shall take every man a lamb according to their father's houses, a lamb for a household, and if the household is too small for a lamb, then a man and his neighbor next to his house shall take according to the number of persons, according to what each can eat, you shall make your count for the lamb. Your lamb shall be without blemish. A male, a year old, you shall take it from the sheep or from the goats, and you shall keep it until the 14th day of this month, when the whole assembly of the congregation of the Israel shall kill their lambs in the evening. Then they shall take some of the blood and put it on the two doorposts, and the lintel of the houses in which they eat them. They shall eat the flesh that night, roasted with unleavened bread and bitter herbs, they shall eat it. In this manner you shall eat it. Your loins guarded, your saddles on your feet, and your staff in your hand and you shall eat it in haste. It is the Lord's Passover. For I will pass through the land of Egypt that night, and I will strike all the firstborn in the land of Egypt, both man and beast, and all the goals of Egypt, I will execute judgments. I am the Lord. The blood shall be signed for you upon the houses where you are. And when I see the blood, I will pass over you, and no plague shall fall upon you to destroy you when I strike the land of Egypt. This day shall be for you a memorial day, and you shall keep it as a feast to the Lord. Throughout your generations, you shall observe it as an ordinance forever. The word of the Lord. The response to the psalm. The cup of blessing is a participation in the blood of Christ. The cup of blessing is a participation in the blood of Christ. How can I repay the Lord for all his goodness to me? The cup of salvation I will raise, I will call on the name of the Lord. The cup of blessing is a participation in the blood of Christ. How 
precious in the eyes of the Lord is the death of his faithful. Your servant am I, the son of your handmaid. You have loosened my bones. The cup of blessing is a participation in the blood of Christ. A thanksgiving sacrifice I make, I will call on the name of the Lord. My vows to the Lord I will fulfill before all his people. The cup of blessing is a participation in the blood of Christ. Second reading, a reading from the first letter of St. Paul to the Corinthians. Brethren, I received from the Lord what I also delivered to you, that the Lord Jesus, Lord Jesus, on the night when he was betrayed, took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way also the chalice after supper say, This chalice in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread, and drink the chalice, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. The word of the Lord. Yes. Kindly let us arise for gospel exclamation. even as I have loved you. Before the feast of the Passover, when Jesus knew that his hour had come to depart out of this world to the Father, having loved his own whom were in the world, he loved them to the end. And during supper, when the devil had already put it into the heart of Judas Iscariot, Simeon's son, to betray him, Jesus, knowing that the Father had given all things into his hand, 
and that he had come from gold and was going to gold, rose from supper, laid aside his garment, and tied a towel around himself. Then he poured water into a basin and began to wash the disciples' feet and to wipe them with a towel that was tied around him. He came to, Pe to Simeon Peter, and Peter said to him, Lord, do you wash my feet? Jesus answered him, What I am doing you do not know now, but afterward you will understand. Peter said to him, You shall never wash my feet. Jesus answered him, If I do not wash you, you have no part in me. Simeon Peter said to him, Lord, not my feet only, but also my heart and my head. Jesus said to him, He who has bathed does not need to wash, expect for his feet, but he is clean over, and you are clean, but not all of you. For he knew who was to betray him. That's why he said, You are not all clean. When he had washed their feet and taken his garment and resumed his place, he said to them, Do you know what I have done to you? You call me teacher and Lord, and you are right, for so I am. If I then, your Lord and teacher, have washed your feet, you also ought to wash one another's feet. For I have given you an example that you also should do as I have done to you. The Gospel of the Lord. God is good and all the time. Once again, I welcome you to this celebration, and in a very special way, I welcome you to our today's reflection. And before we start this reflection, I want to take you back a bit. You know very well in our liturgical celebrations, the most important period is actually the Holy Week. And during this Holy Week, we celebrate in a very special way the Paschal Mysteries of Jesus Christ. His passion, death, and resurrection. However, again, in this new week, there are these three days which we call the Easter Triduum, the three important days within the liturgy of the church. That is the Holy Thursday, Good Friday, and Easter Saturday. You realize, of course, we have only one celebration that runs across or runs within these three days. And it starts with this Holy Thursday celebration, and this is the greatest feast of our Lord's Supper. And you realize this celebration will continue. That is the reason why at the very end we are not going to receive the final blessings. It will run through tomorrow as we celebrate the passion of our Lord Jesus Christ and the climax of this celebration again because you realize even tomorrow there are no blessings at the end of the celebration. The blessings will be given during the Easter Vigil which we call the mother of all vigils. And that celebration of the Easter vigil, because of its importance in the liturgy of the church, it runs all the way to the Sunday celebration when we shall be celebrating 
the resurrection of our Lord Jesus Christ. This celebration of the Lord's Supper, it has three important components. The Holy Eucharist, the institution of the priesthood, and the commandment of love. But in my approach today, this evening, we'll look at it in three ways. The Jewish Passover, the new Passover, and living the new Passover. From our first reading, we heard about the celebration of the Jewish Passover. It is important to note that this Passover was a combination of two festivities or two festivals. The festival of Passover and the festival of the unleavened bread. The festival of Passover reminded the Israelites about God passing over the houses of the Israelites where the blood of the Passover lamb was applied on the post or in the lintels. And this was a reminder of that nomadic festival, the festival of Passover, where an old sheep was celebrated in terms of slaughtering it, and then the blood of this lamb would be sprinkled among the other sheep to ward off the evil spirit. So first of all, it was a nomadic celebration. This has been modeled to serve as a reminder to the Israelites because when the blood of the sheep was applied on the doorpost, it was a sign for them that truly when the angel of death would be coming among the Egyptians, he would be able to pass over the house of the Israelites. The blood that was applied on the lintel became a blood that ward off and the plague would not fall or even destroy the Israelites. The second thing or the second festival was the festival of the unleavened bread. This was originally observed to mark the end of old seasons crop of cereal and the celebration of bread baked with a new seasoned flour. It represented the old life is gone and the new season, the new life has started. This is also linked to the Exodus experience because in their hasty departure from Egypt, the Israelites had no time to wait until the dove was unleavened. You heard from that reading, you shall eat the flesh that night, roasted with unleavened bread and bitter herbs. The celebration, therefore, of this Passover foreshadowed the earlier, overshadowed the earlier significance of these two festivals by the connection to the Exodus. And remember very well, Exodus was the greatest event in the Israelites. You cannot talk about the Jewish history or even the history of the Israelites without mentioning the Exodus. These two combinations, therefore, they formed this great exodus or this celebration of exodus which marked the greatest event in the life of Israel. This new religious significance recalled God's salvation to his people when he liberated them from the enslavement of the Egyptians. One thing which is very, very important, therefore, in this celebration is what we call the Passover lamb. And we heard from that reading, it must be physically perfect, no deformity. 
deformed animals, as we know, even in our African setup, even in our uh, traditions, were not offered for sacrifice. And they were to be either black or white, of course, depending on the nature of the pup or the purpose of the sacrifice. Why were we not to offer a sheep or even a lamb that has defect or had defect? The reason is that the life force of that deformed animal has been disturbed. That is very, very important. The life form of that deformed lamb or even the animal that was sacrificed is disturbed. And therefore you could only offer a lamb that had no defect. We heard again, this was to be slaughtered in the evening and before dark. Why? It was protection against unseen supernatural dangers. That was according to the traditions of the Jews. It was to be roasted. There was a change in terms of the consumption or preparation of the consumed meat from the time they were preparing them in the nomadic times to the time of Israelites. And what he said, at that particular moment, they would have relapsed even to consuming animals that were not fully cooked. And to ensure this is fully cooked, they were asked not even to boil it, but to roast it. Then it was to be taken with bitter herbs. This was a symbol of the sufferings that they underwent in Egypt. In their consumption, your loins must be guarded, your sandals on your feet, and your staff in your heart. These things that are mentioned here, they were left outside. They were left outside of the house. You could not take them in the house. And therefore, it is an indication that the people celebrated this festival as if they were outside. They ate in haste and in fear due to God's presence and in anticipation of the long journey that awaited them. It is the Passover of the Lord. They had to be in hurry because God has come to liberate them from the enslavement of Egyptians and he is ready to give them a new life. This let alone as we see in the history of the Israelites, it became a memorable day and they were asked to keep it. You shall keep it as a feast to the Lord throughout all your generations. That indicates the sacramental character of the original Passover sacrifice because at this particular moment they remembered the protection against the evil one. Its significance for Israel, Israelites lay in the power to recall what took place at the Exodus, the saving intervention of God who enabled Israel to pass from slavery to the freedom of a new covenant or covenant relationship, and that is a passage from death to life. I would summarize that by saying that old Passover was a reminder of God's intervention in the history of Israelites when he liberated them from all the enslavement, and especially the enslavement of the Egyptians, and he made a new covenant with them to journey with them and to give them a new life. Let's go to the second part, the new Passover. The Passover of the Jews anticipated the Passover of Jesus Christ. Remember, this was recognized even by John the Baptist, and you read this in John chapter 1, verse 29, when John the Baptist pointed at Jesus Christ at the Passover lamb, and he said, Behold the Lamb of God, 
who takes away the sin of the world. The sin of the world, not the sins of the world, the sin of the world. I will explain why the sin. The blood of the Lamb delivered the Israelites from destruction. When John pointed to Jesus, at that particular time, you remember, it was during the Passover. There were many lambs that had been ferried. Actually, they were being taken to Jerusalem from the country districts to serve as sacrifices for the Passover feast. However, here we see John pointing at the only true lamb, the true sacrifice, who can and who will deliver them from the sin. The reason why John talks about sin and not sins is because sin is not just an act, is actually a condition, is actually a disposition. And that is what Jesus Christ came to liberate us from. It is a condition whereby we could not liberate ourselves from. It could not be affected by something from inside. Something must have come from outside. And this something is not just an ordinary thing. It is the Son of God who came from outside, from God, to enter into the lives of the human person, the heart of the human person, to transform him from that condition of sinfulness into a moment and even a moment of grace or an opportunity of grace so that he could be able to live a new life. The Passover love, Jesus Christ, will liberate us not from the geographical enslavement, but from something higher, higher enslavement, which is sin and death. I love the homily that was given by St. Meritus of Sardis, who was the bishop in the early church. And he says, the land that was slain has delivered us from death and given us life. The mystery of Passover, that is a mystery, or that mystery is Jesus Christ, who clothed himself in humanity in the womb of Blessed Virgin Mary, and was born man. Having then a body capable of suffering, he took the pain of fallen man upon himself, he triumphed over the diseases of the soul and the body that were its curse, and by spirit, which was incapable of dying, and therefore he dealt man's death a fatal blow. He continues to say, this is very, very important for me and for you. He ransomed us from our servitude to the world as he ransomed Israel from the land of Egypt. He freed us from the slavery to devil as he had freed Israel from the heart of Pharaoh, in Hebrew, Pharaoh, in English, Pharaoh. He sealed our souls with his own spirit and the members of our body with his own blood. He is the one who covered death with shame and cast the devil into mourning as Moses cast Pharaoh into mourning. He is the one who smote sin and robbed iniquity of offspring as Moses robbed Egyptians of their offspring. Therefore, sin has no offspring. Sin has no power. It has been conquered by Jesus Christ, the new Passover lamb. He is the one who brought out us out of slavery into freedom, out of darkness into light, out of death into life, out of tyranny 
into eternal kingdom. He has made us priesthood, a people chosen to be his own forever. He is the Passover of our salvation. This new Passover, Jesus has taken it and indicated it in a profound manner that he is the one who is being sacrificed for the salvation of the world. But he had to put it in a way so that people could understand and also give them an opportunity to celebrate it as a memorial. And celebrating it as a memorial in a sacramental way, it will give them value and even bring efficacy in their lives so that they may live a new life and not life to death. Saint Ignatius of Antioch said, Eucharist, therefore, is the one bread which is the medicine of immortality and the antidote against death, enabling us to live forever in Jesus Christ. This is put in a very clear way in the second reading, where we had Jesus Christ therefore taking bread and taking wine. And after breaking the bread, he gave it to his disciples and told them, take this and eat it. And after that, he gave them his, the chalice and he said, take this, this is my blood, the blood of the new and everlasting covenant, the new covenant. And he told them, do this in memory of me. In that we see two things that are very, very important. There is the body which is represented by that bread and there is the chalice. And of course the chalice is talking about blood. When we talk of the body, it is a symbol of character or even characteristics of a given person. When Jesus Christ is telling us, take this body and eat it, he is not doing that symbolically. He is doing it in reality. That's why the body of Jesus Christ, the Eucharist, is not a symbol. It is the body of Jesus Christ and he tells us, take this body and eat it. When we eat the body of Jesus Christ, we take the character of Jesus Christ and make it our own. We take the characteristics of Jesus Christ and they become our own. Our humanity is assumed in the life of Jesus Christ. Our life as human persons is absorbed in the life of Jesus Christ. Then when we talk of the chalice, it is blood. And blood is a symbol of life. Jesus Christ is giving us his life so that we may no longer be dead, but we will be living subjects. And wherever we are, we will be able to manifest the living Christ in our context or even in our lives. Therefore, the body and blood of Jesus Christ reminds us that we are incorporated in the life of Jesus Christ and we live in that life of Jesus. I remember when we were learning, uh, studying metaphysics, there were two things that were very, very important in general, and especially when we are talking about the subjects. And there is what we call the universal, and even there is what we call the particular. And you realize the universal, the actually there is the commonality of this everywhere. For example, when we talk of truth, truth is universal. But when you talk of true, that is a more of particular. 
and therefore you realize we are told the particular must be absorbed in the universal. And for us human beings who are particular, we must therefore be absorbed and be absorbed in the universal. And this is where the human person must be absorbed in the life of God so that every time you manifest an aspect of that life of God. When Christ is telling us, therefore, take my body, he is telling us to take his character and make it our own. But you realize it is not possible. We are the only one who can take a particular aspect of Jesus Christ. The characteristics of Jesus Christ, there are many, but allow me just to mention a few. One of them, we must be truthful. We must enter into the life of the one who is truth himself. We must also allow ourselves to give ourselves to others. Jesus Christ did not reserve anything for himself. He gives to totality. And he offered his self, as we celebrate tomorrow, when he is lifted up on the cross, he offered himself in totality. He could not retain anything for himself. Then Jesus Christ values us more. He values the human person, not things. And because of valuing us more, he offered himself for the ransom of each and every one of us. I remember yesterday's gospel when Judas Iscariot went to the priests, to the chief priests, and he told them, what will you give me if I deliver him to you? What will you give me if I deliver him to you? Maybe that question resonates with you in a way. How many times we have asked people, what are you going to give me if I do what I am supposed to do? What will you give me if I actually give this service to you? What will you give me if I do one thing to you? What would you give me if actually I do this business for you, even if I am supposed to do it as a human person? Jesus Christ is not or does not look at what he is going to gain from what he does. He looks at what the subjects who are the human person are going to gain by what he does. And it is a theological truth that whatever Jesus Christ did, did not do it for himself, but he did it for the human person. He gave his all to all of us that we may have life and have it in full. Christ again, he is the one who forgives without a limit. He is open to forgiveness. He is compassionate. He is loving. He opens his heart for all to benefit. In the same way, Jesus Christ is asking us that we may conform with him and offer ourselves for the greater glory of God and even for the common good. How is this possible? The gospel of today gives an answer. And this is a third theme. And this is what we say, living the new Passover, which is washing the feet of other people, and again, giving ourselves for others. We hear from the gospel, Jesus rose from supper, laid aside his garment, and tied a towel allowed himself. He then poured water into basin and began to wash his disciples' feet and to wipe them with a the towel that was tied around him. 
And at the very end of that gospel, he says, Do you know what I have done to you? You call me teacher and Lord. And you are right, for so I am. If I then, your Lord and teacher, have washed your feet, you also ought to wash one's feet. For I have given you an example that you also should do as I have done to you. That is the greatest lesson of how we live the new Passover. It is by washing the feet of our brothers and sisters. It is giving ourselves to others. The greatest lesson we learn from this text is that there is greatness in service the dignity of service. The world is full of people who are studying on their dignity when they are supposed to be kneeling at the feet of their brothers and sisters. The question maybe this afternoon or this evening is, are you studying on your dignity? Are you studying on your feet because you do not want your dignity to be touched in one way or another. Are you ready to kneel at the feet of your brother and sister and wash that particular person? How many people are looking for you for a word of encouragement? How many people are looking for you that you may give a word to support them in their journey because they are heartbroken? How many people in your families or even in the community or even the society are looking for you so that you can become maybe a prop to keep them studying? How many people are broken in their lives and they are looking for you to help them make their ways? How many broken families are there and perhaps you can be able to start there and support those people in their journey? How many young people are lost perhaps because you have become an obstacle in their lives? How many young people they are destroying their lives perhaps because I have frustrated them in their lives? Am I studying or am I needing that I may wash the feet of these people. Jesus Christ is asking you this evening, and he's also asking me this evening, that you may journey with him during this Easter, freedom that truly what becomes an obstacle in my life, that I am not able to give the very best for myself, and even to give that service, to render that service, as an instrument of Jesus Christ, as an authentic disciple of Jesus Christ, I may shed it off. And shedding it off is dying in the old life and rising with Jesus in the new life. My brothers and sisters, let us therefore rise with Jesus Christ. Let us lay aside our garments of pride, let us tie the tower of humility around ourselves, let us put water into the basin, the water of love, and let us begin, sorry, let us begin to wash the feet of our brothers and sisters. And when we do that, we'll be able to wipe them with that tower of compassion and you will create a new community, a true body of our Lord Jesus Christ. Tumsifu Yesu Christo.
Uh, so now listening to the word of God, we'll go to the second part of this liturgy, and that is the washing of the feet, symbolizing what Jesus Christ did and becoming an invitation to each and every one of us to do the same by washing the feet of our brothers and sisters.
are now going to arise and we have the universal prayers. In the name of Jesus, our salvation, life and salvation, let us offer our prayers to God. For our church and parish and for all the people of God, that we may follow the example of Christ who was the feet of his disciples, let us pray to the Lord. For Pope Francis and the Philip Anora, our bishop, and for all bishops, priests and deacons, that they may be faithful in imitators of Christ the servant, let us pray to the Lord. For the nations and the peoples of the world, that Christ's peace and justice may reign forever, let us pray to the Lord. For those who teach the gospel, that they may bring the life of Christ the young and old alike, let us pray to the Lord. For the sick and dying, that the peace and hearing of the risen Christ may be theirs, let us pray to the Lord. For the suffering and imprisoned, for the dedicated and the abused, that they may know the freedom of the cross, let us pray to the Lord. For our deceased brothers and sisters, that they may live forever in the light of the risen Christ, let us pray to the Lord. Father in heaven, hear the prayers we make before you. May we serve you by serving one another. May we give you thanks for Christ, our Passover bread, by becoming bread for one another. May we rejoice in these Easter mysteries by becoming light and healing for our broken world. We offer these prayers through Christ, our Lord.
celebrated, the work of our redemption is accomplished. Through Christ our Lord. The Lord be with you. Lift up your heart. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is still right and just our duty and our salvation always and ever to give you thanks, Lord, Holy Father, Almighty and Eternal God. Through Christ our Lord. For he is a true and eternal priest who instituted the pattern of an everlasting sacrifice and was the first to offer himself as a saving victim, commanding us to make this offering as his memorial. As we eat his flesh that was sacrificed for us, we are made strong. And as we drink this blood that was poured out for us, we are washed clean. And so, with the angels and archangels, with thrones and dominions, and with all the hosts and powers of heaven, we sing the hymn of your glory, as without aid we acclaim. Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, that you accept and bless these gifts, these offerings, these holy and unblemished sacrifices, which we offer you firstly for your holy Catholic Church. Be pleased to grant her peace, to God, unite and govern her through the whole world, together with your servant, Francis, our Pope, and Philip, our Bishop, and all those who, holding to the truth, had on the Catholic and apostolic faith. Remember, Lord, your servants, and all gathered here, whose figure devotion are known to you. For them we offer you this sacrifice of praise, or they offer it themselves, and all who are dear to them, for the redemption of their souls, in hope of health and well-being, and paying their homage to you, the eternal God living and true. celebrating the most sacred day on which our Lord Jesus Christ 
was handed over for our sake and in communion with those whose memory we venerate, especially the glorious ever Virgin Mary, Mother of our God and Lord Jesus Christ. And blessed Joseph, her spouse, your blessed apostles and martyrs, Peter and Paul, Andrew, James, John, Thomas, Philip, Bartholomew, Matthew, Simon and Jude, Linus, Cletus, Clement, Sixtus, Cornelius, Cyprian, Lawrence, Chrysogonus, John and Paul, Cosmas and Domian, and all your saints, we ask that through their merits and prayers, in all things we may be defended by your protecting help. Therefore, Lord, we pray, graciously accept the oblation of our service, that of your holy family which we make to you, as you observe the day on which our Lord Jesus Christ handed on the mysteries of his body and blood for his disciples to celebrate. Order our days in your peace, and command that we be delivered from eternal damnation and counted among the flock of those who have chosen you have chosen. Through Christ our Lord, be pleased, O oh God, we pray, to bless, acknowledge, and approve this offering in every respect. Make it spiritual and acceptable, so that it may become for us the body of your most beloved, the body and blood of your most beloved Son, our Lord Jesus Christ. On the day before he was to suffer for our salvation and the salvation of all that is today, he took bread in his holy and venerable hands and with eyes raised to heaven to you O God his almighty father giving you thanks he said the blessing broke the bread and gave it to his disciples saying take this all of you and eat of it for this is my body which will be given up for you In a similar way, when supper was added, he took the chalice. In his precious, he took this precious chalice in his holy and venerable hands. And once more giving you thanks, he said the blessing and gave the chalice to his disciples, saying, Take this, all of you, and drink from it. For this is the chalice of my blood, the blood of the new and eternal covenant, which will be poured out for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Do this in memory of me. The mystery of faith. When we eat this bread and drink this cup, we proclaim your death, O Lord, until you come again. Therefore, O oh Lord, as we celebrate the memorial of the blessed passion, the resurrection from the dead, and the glorious ascension into heaven of Christ, your Son, our Lord, we, your servants and your holy people, offer to your glorious majesty from the gifts that you have given us, this pure victim, this holy victim, this portress victim, the holy bread of eternal life, and the chalice of everlasting salvation. Be pleased to look upon these offerings with a serene and kindly countenance and to accept them, as once you are pleased to accept the gifts of your servant Abel the just, the sacrifice of Abraham our father in faith, 
and the offering of your high priest Melchizedek, a holy sacrifice, a spotless victim. In humble prayer, we ask you, Almighty God, command these gifts be born by the hands of your holy angel to your altar on high, in the sight of your divine majesty, so that all of us who through this participation at this altar receive the most holy body and blood of your Son, may be filled with every grace and heavenly blessings. Thank you. Remember also, Lord, your servant, his great Pope Francis, our Pope, and his grace, Pile Bagnolo. Remember, Lord, your servants who have gone before us with the sign of faith and rest in the sleep of peace. Grant them, O oh Lord, we pray, and all who sleep in Christ, a place of refreshment, light, and peace. Uh, to us, also your servants, who, though sinners, hope in your abundant mercies, graciously grant some share and fellowship with your holy apostles and martyrs, with John the Baptist, Stephen, Matthias, Barnabas, Ignatius, Alexander, Marcellinus, Peter, Felicity, Perpetua, Agatha, Lucy, Agnes, Cecilia, Anastasia, and all your saints, admit as we beseech you into their company, not weighing our merits, but granting us your pardon through Christ our Lord. Through whom you continue to make all these good things, O Lord. You sanctify them, fill them with life, bless them, and bestow them upon us. Through him, and with him, and in him, O God Almighty Father, in the unity of the Holy Spirit, all glory and honor is yours forever and ever. Lord, we pray from every evil, graciously grant peace in our days, that by the help of your mercy, we may be always free from sin and safe from all distress, as we await the blessed hope and the coming of our Savior, Jesus Christ. Lord Jesus Christ, who said to your apostles, peace I leave you, my peace I give you. Look not on our sins but on the faith of your church, and graciously grant her peace and unity in accordance with your will, who live and reign forever and ever. And the peace of the Lord be with you always. Let us offer each other the sign of peace.
Behold the Lamb of God. Behold him who takes away the sins of the world. Blessed are those who are called to the supper of the Lamb. May the body of our Lord Jesus Christ keep us safe for eternal life.
This is the body that will be given up for you. This is the chalice of the new covenant in my blood, says the Lord. Do this whenever you receive it in memory of me. Let us pray. Grant, Almighty God, that just as we are renewed by the supper of your Son in this present age, so we may enjoy his banquet for all eternity, who lives and reigns forever and ever. After that celebration, we are going to have the adoration just here in the main church at the altar. We are going to take half an hour at most. Then after that, you have a procession to take the Holy Sacrament, the Holy Eucharist, to the altar of repose at our adoration chapel. We request that we may give time to this adoration. Let us truly adore even if for a few minutes. After we take the Holy Eucharist to the altar of repose, we we'll still have adoration learning through, but as it is indicated, the adoration should not go beyond uh, midnight. We remind you tomorrow, the way of the cross is going to start at nine to be flagged by his grace, most revered Philip Agnolo, and then we'll have the service of the passion of Christ here in this ch church at 3 p.m. So now, we can kneel for adoration.
of our population in silence for 15 years.
But our Father, we believe that you are the creator of all things and that you have made us for yourself close to the face of your son who was born of the Virgin Mary by the work of the Holy Spirit to be our means and guarantee of eternal life. We believe, Provident Father, that by the power of your Spirit, bread and wine become transformed into the body and blood of your Son, the finest wheat that eases the hungers of our journey. We believe, Lord Jesus, that your incarnation is continued in the wheat grain of your Eucharist, Eucharistic body in order to nourish our yearning for light and life, love and forgiveness, grace and salvation. We believe that in the Eucharist you inserted yourself into the history in order to sustain pilgrims in their weakness and all who dream reap the fruits of their toil. We know that at Bethlehem, the house of bread, the eternal father prepared in the womb of the Virgin Mary the bread that he offers those hungering for the infinite. We believe, Jesus, in the Eucharist, that you are really and truly present in the consecrated bread and wine, extending your saving presence and offering to your flock abundant pastures and fresh water. We believe that our eyes are deceived in seeing bread and our tongue mistaken in tasting wine because it is all your entire self offered in sacrifice and giving life to the world, paradise for which is always starved. That night in the Chenaco, Lord, in taking bread and wine in your hands, you offered these gifts to all for all time and infinite ages. With you, Lamb of the Covenant, there is raised up, there is raised up on every altar on which you offer yourself to the Father, the fruits of the earth and the work of human hands, the life of the believer, the doubt of the seeker, the laughter of children, the plans of youth, the pain of those who suffer, and the offering of the giver and the one who gives himself to his brethren. We believe, Lord Jesus, that your goodness has prepared a table for the great and little ones and that at your table we become brothers and sisters by giving our lives for one another as you did for us. We believe, Jesus, that on the altar of your sacrifice we receive strength for our weak flesh, which does not always respond to the yearnings of the Spirit but which you will transform into the image of your body. We believe that at the table prepared for all, there will always be a place for those who seek, a room for those at the fridges of our society, the signs of death being overcome, a new heaven and a new earth opening. We believe, Jesus, that you have not deserted your brethren. You remain 
discreetly present in the sanctuary of conscience and in the bread and wine of your table as light and strength for the weak pilgrim. Thank you, Jesus, in the Eucharist for preparing us to undertake a new evangelization strengthened by you. May your mother accompany those who are willing to leave and announce your word. And through her intercession, bring its seed to fruition. Amen.